So it was 1968. My dad resigned his professorship at Syracuse University, came home, said, Carol, kids, get in the car. We're going to Alaska. We're going to live in the wilderness. So we headed north to Lake Iliamna. And, uh, well, about a year later, due to some unforeseen circumstances, combined with uh, some severe miscalculations, <laughs> we were destitute, homeless, and just a band of gypsies. And we finally washed up on a little lake north of Talkeetna, up in what's known as the Chase area along the railroad. It's all roadless up there. And we be began to rebuild our lives. Uh, built a cabin for my parents and my siblings, uh, two preteens and a six-year-old. I was 20 at that time. And uh, with the help of some of my high school buddies who came north for adventure as well, we got that done and started to get back on our feet until September of 1973, when the cabin, my parents' cabin, caught fire and burned to the ground. And we tried to fight it, uh, but we were unprepared. We were just really chichacos. Uh, we didn't have fire extinguishers. The buckets we had were in the house. <laughs> so there we are fighting this thing, and it's just, just, just mind-blowing how a uh, cabin will burn glorified kindling. And it's getting dark, and out of the night sky comes a float plane. And we know this plane. It was Don Sheldon. who, <clears throat> Yes, you guys know that name. He's the most famous pilot in Alaska at the time, probably still is. But he was our float plane pilot whenever we could get a plane in to fly freight in. And he circles the lake and comes in and lands. And it's really dark, but of course the cabin is glowing pretty bright. And there was a rubber raft out in the middle of the lake, one of those little yellow ones, two-person raft that we'd gotten for the kids, and it was illuminated. So he comes in for a landing, comes over to the dock, taxis in, gets out on the float as he's coming in. And my dad steps out on the dock and says, well, did you bring the marshmallows? <laughs> it's, yeah, that's typical Alaska macho stuff. But Don was serious. He goes, oh, is anybody hurt? Is everybody okay? That's the way he talked. He had kind of an exaggerated Midwestern accent. And we said, we're all all right. He says, okay, well, I got to get going because it's going to be too dark to land in Talkeetna. He's, we said, well, how do you do that? And he, <laughs> and he said, well, we're a fly-by-night operation anyway. <laughs> I'll be back in in a couple of days. So a couple of days later, he came back in. And what are you going to do? Well, we're going to rebuild. We got some neighbors have come by, and we're going to pitch in and build another cabin. He says, oh, well, you're going to need a moose to feed all these guys. And you're not going to get one around here with all the chainsaws and the hammers going on. I'll fly somebody out, and we'll get one. So, yeah, that was me. <laughs> I got in the plane with Don, and we took off across the Susitna Valley to the west side over by the Alaska Range. Um, and on the way, he's telling me, he says, you want to get a nice, fat, barren cow. And, and he told me that a couple of times. A nice, fat, barren cow. She'll have that needle on the backbone, and it's the best. So he picks out a little lake, typical lake for the Sioux Valley, uh, swamp on both ends, and a little forest on each side. And the lake was kind of shaped like a mitten like that. I set up my camp where the thumb meets the hand. My camp, yeah. It was like a, a value village two-person orange pup tent that Boy Scouts would be embarrassed to sleep in. <laughs> so I, I set up camp, and it's already getting late, so I walk down what, the thumb, which is like a little bay. It's about 50 yards, and then 20, 30 yards across the beaver dam and, and back up towards the uh, main end of the lake because it was good moose country. It was all muskegging and swampy. And the light is falling, and I'm about, oh, 40 yards, 50 yards, looking right across this little bay to my tent, and there's this big, dark thing there. And I didn't remember it, because I don't know this place. I said, geez, could that be a moose? He's practically standing on my tent. <laughs> and I looked at it, and it didn't move, and it didn't move, and it's getting darker. And I waited about five minutes, and, it, and finally it moved just a little bit. The light changed. I said, well, that's a moose. So I raised the rifle, and uh, the first rule of hunting, actually, <laughs> the first rule of hunting is don't shoot your buddy. 
<laughs> or yourself. The second rule is don't take a careless shot. We all know that. But uh, what I lacked in judgment, I made up for an initiative, and I, and I fired. <laughs> and the moose took off, so I had to go all the way back around, and I was chasing it down. I found some blood on the, on the grass, and it was on a game trail, so I... I ran full speed through the woods, keeping track of where the lake was all the time. Remember where the lake is. And I caught up with that moose, and I finished the job. Don't mean to sound callous, but that's what I was there to do. And uh, the first thing was to locate the lake, and I climbed up on a little knoll, and there it was, right where it was supposed to be. So I gutted the moose that night. Next day, I quartered it, packed it out to the lake, and all I had to do was wait for Don to come back in. So on about the fourth day, here he came back. Well, yeah, he wasn't going to come back right away because he wants to give me some time to get a moose. He didn't expect one was going to step on my tent the first night. <laughs> and uh, he's taxiing, and I'm there. Cause, yeah, yeah, I can do it. Hey, Don. And he pulls in. He's out on the float. He goes, what did you get? I said, oh, hell, I got a nice, fat, barren cow. And, and he explodes just explodes on me, starts screaming at me, and he unleashed a string of profanities like I've never heard. And the shocking thing is, Don was old school. He never used that language, never used anything harsher than holy buckets or fudgesicle. But he's unloading on me. Get that flipping, flipping, zipping, zipping, chicken licking, dicking, dicking thing in the plane. So I take, take the pieces, and the pieces, as most of you know, are big. <laughs> and heavy and awkward, and I'm in the lake, and I'm handing him up on the float, and he's still screaming at me, come on, come on, come on, not moving fast enough. So after about four or five of these pieces, I'm getting winded, my, my chest hurts, my, my throat hurts, and I take a little breather. No, no, get going. And he just keeps screaming at me, and I'm getting pissed. I get in the plane finally, we get it loaded, take off, and I'm looking out the window. About 10 minutes go by, and I feel this little tap on my shoulder. I go, what? And he's got this big grin on his face. And he says, well, I guess I neglected to tell you we had switched game units. <laughs> so I'm man enough to see the humor in that. So we had a chuckle over it. Got that moose delivered. Got the men fed. Got the cabin built and it's standing there to this day. <laughs>